figure out. Uh, so, uh, uh, okay, so, so, so there are certain vertices. So the, let's say there are n vertices and then there are, this graph is being built dynamically because there is edges being added and deleted on the fly. And uh, so for example, you know, you want to, uh, you have a request of connecting vertex one with vertex seven with an edge. Uh, then you might have a request for connecting vertex two. Uh, you should be able to see that. So that's happening on this side of the screen. Uh, edges are being hooked up and this goes on for a while and you keep maintaining this graph in, in your favorite data structure, what you want is at some point there will be a query that comes in which wants to find out the length of let's say the shortest path connecting vertex one to vertex 10. Okay? And in this particular case, the, uh, the answer is two because the thing in red shows the length of the shortest path and uh, you should be able to give answers to such queries as and when they come in a relatively short amount of time, that's the goal. And again, you know, so this continues, uh, some edge goes down in the network, so you have to delete uh, uh, the edge connecting vertex three to vertex 10. And again, you have the query, of course, the length of the shortest path for connecting the same two, uh, same pair of vertices has changed, and now it's three, and you get the idea. So again, uh, you know, a certain edge goes down, and then there, there comes a query, and the, and the and the answer is very different. It gets, it keeps changing the, uh, the the paths in this graph. Now, what you want is to be able to support such add, delete, query operations in your data structure without the data structure being too big in size. Let's say the data structure is polynomial in the size, which is the number of vertices in your graph. And at the same time, uh, you want the the these these operations to be to to, to run pretty efficiently in the sense that you should be able to do support this add, delete, and query operations uh, in poly log n amortized query complexity, which where, where n is the number of vertices in your graph. Okay? That's your goal. So it's a very, uh, very natural goal. Uh, these kind of problems come up in many different situations. And uh, the particular example that I've shown is the dynamic shortest path problem, but there could be many graph problems and, uh, and also in, in other domains where you have a very similar situation. Uh, that you want to do, you want to be able to build a data structure which runs efficiently and efficiently would mean polylogarithmic amortized cost now this problem looks hard uh, and we don't know uh, we can't prove the hardness neither do we have uh, an efficient data structure realization of this so why does it look hard so let me try to convince you so let's take a very special case of this problem where you have uh, a, a special set of vertices which we will call x and then uh, v and, and, and edges here will, be, will form a, just a bipartite graph. And again, you will have a bipartite graph connecting the special vertex y to vertices uh, in the group v. So, in, and, and it will be, a, it, it, I'll describe the problem as a three-phase problem. So in the first phase, what will happen is you will get requests of connecting uh, vertices on the x partition to vertices uh, in, in the middle layer, which is v. So you connect them, and let's say, since there are k vertices, uh, what's happening is each of these vertex can get connected to at most n such vertices. So the total number of operations that you count here is k times n, right? Because every vertex here gets connected to at most n vertices. So there are k times n edges that are being added at most. So you would want, assuming that the, the tau is your, what you're aiming for is uh, that you would support this, um, you would have this amortized cost as tau, then the total amount of time that you get to do these operations is k times n times tau. And that's phase one. So this is a very special case. In phase two, what you get is you, uh, you, you have to connect the vertex y to its neighbors. So the, it, its neighbors get specified. And that again has at most n edges, so you get order n tau time. Right? And finally, all you have to do is query the length of the shortest path from x i to y. Okay? And uh, if you see it, it's, it's pretty clear. So the length of the shortest path is exactly two, if and only if x i, so now you can view the sets x i to be a subset of one through n. If you look at the neighbor, neighborhood of x i, that specifies a subset of one through n. And if you look at the neighborhood of y, that also specifies the subset. So you want to see if xi, the subset xi intersection of y is empty, 
only then, uh, sorry, is non-empty, then you get a, a, a path length of two. So in some sense, you're solving a dynamic version of set disjointness, just for, for doing this special graph case. And, um, and, 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 and the time that you require is, is so, uh, the, the, the time that you have is so little uh, that you think the best thing that you can do is sort of go through all the possible uh, vertices in here and see is, there, is, is V connected to Xi and is it connected to Y. So that's the intuition to believe that this problem is hard, and uh, but but that nothing is known about it. So <clears throat> you're only getting order tau time, and the question is, can tau be polylog? Now my claim is that there is a communication bottleneck hiding here. So so just the intuition that I just said now can be formalized uh, in, uh, in terms of a communication game, and then it becomes even more compelling to believe that indeed there is a bottleneck here. Okay, and that's, that, that, that would be my idea to, to show in the next few slides what is the communication game. So in order to do that, I will quickly remind, remind you of the classical communication game introduced by Yao. We will have to use a certain variant of that game. So let me just quickly uh, recap uh, what uh, this crowd certainly knows very well. So you have two players, Alice and Bob. And uh, unlike Yao, what I have done is I have put the inputs on their forehead, not in hand, which because this will be uh, convenient for us. So Alice on her forehead has got uh, a set of input x and Bob has y on his forehead. So Alice sees y, Bob sees x. Okay. And they want to jointly compute some function f which depends on both sets of inputs x and y. And they have unbounded computational power. So uh, the only thing is of course they're all each missing a, a, a crucial piece of information. And uh, what Alice and Bob do is they collaborate uh, based on a mutually agreed protocol. To compute this function, so Alice takes turn in sending uh, some bit to, to Bob, which is some arbitrary function specified by the protocol of the input that Alice has access to, which is y in this case. And then Bob returns back with an answer, uh, which now depends on what he sees and what Alice has uh, sent him before. And this goes on for a while. Uh, let's say for our rounds at protocol termination, let's say Bob terminates the protocol by sending a final bit. Both Alice and Bob ought to know the answer of the function. So uh, the, the output obviously depends on uh, what Bob has access to x and the entire uh, communication history. Okay, so um, uh, the point is, uh, the point of these games is what is the minimum cost required to compute this function? So the minimum, the cost of a protocol again is measured in terms of the worst case cost. And as you can see, trivially, the complexity of any, any of this, any function is at most n plus one, where n is the length of the uh, input for, uh, of, on both Alice and Bob's forehead. And why is that? Simply because Alice can transfer uh, all that she sees to Bob and who can compute the answer. Right? And, 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 and the main question here is to understand how much you can save on that trivial protocol given that the function f has a certain structure. Okay. So how much can you exploit the structure? So I will be quick with it because this is very basic and it's known to everybody just to be on the same page. So if you have a function like parity, then it's very, very easy. Uh, it's, a, it's an example of a super easy function here because all that Alice needs to do is to send the parity of the number, uh, the parity of the input that she sees, and then Bob can compute the answer uh, on his input, uh, the parity of his input, and then can give the final answer by just combining the two parities, right? So communication complexity trivially of parity is at most two. And uh, there are several functions like majority, the communication complexity likewise is order log n. In fact, for any symmetric function, it's order log n. So these are examples of easy functions. So what's hard? So uh, a very simple function is hard as you might, as you can uh, imagine uh, from an information theoretic point of view. Uh, you know, if you have the equality function, where it, wherein the players have to verify if x and y are exactly the same n bit string. And if you think about it intuitively, this should require n bits of communication because what else can the players do, right? I mean, they have to verify that every bit that, they, that one player has matches with the bit that the other player has. Okay. So uh, it does require n plus one bits uh, and deterministically, this is a hard function. And uh, the question is, can, if, if you do have access to randomization, does this help? Okay. 
this is a classical example where randomization does help. So, I am being quick here. Uh, why? Because, you know, take the same function equality. Now, Alice and Bob, they have access to public coin uh, randomness. So, they jointly throw some random bits, which we call r. And all that Alice does is takes a hash of y with r. So, Alice takes the inner product of r and y modulo 2, sends back the one bit answer to Bob. And uh, Bob just checks if his answer matches. So, if x inner product with r gives the same answer. If, if not, he declares, in this case, it, it does not match. He declares that the, that, the, that the inputs are not equal. Of course, if the inputs were equal, the, you would never get this difference. And the, the key observation, which is very simple, is that whenever x and y are different, then with probability exactly half, Alice and Bob would be able to discover it okay, by, by a random pointer. So, the moral is that in the two player classical uh, model, randomization does help si significantly. It can reduce the cost exponentially uh, from n plus 1 to constant. Okay. Now, uh, this is my last slide about the classical model. So, what is the limits of random protocol? Uh, Here is a function that is very hard even for randomized protocol which would be a function that we would stay with in this talk for a while. So, this is called the set disjoinness function. Again, a very natural function. You have two pairs of input x and y. Now, you view them as subsets of some universe 1 through n. Okay. And uh, disjoinness, as the name suggests, outputs 1 exactly when the two sets x and y are uh, pairwise, uh, are, are mutually disjoined. Now, uh, if you are wondering in terms of bits, well, you know, uh, you can view Alice's input as a characteristic vector of x and Bob's input as a characteristic vector of y. And then if there is a column uh, at which both of them have a 1, uh, then the sets are not disjoint. So, in this particular case, the output is 0. Okay. So, in a celebrated result, again, I mean, if you, if you think about it, the intuition is you have to check every column. There are n columns, and what, what can you do other than checking for all L, What can Alice and Bob do? Right? It seems like Alice and Bob have to uh, check column by column. But remember, that was sort of the case also for equality. So, this is a little subtle. Right? Also, in equality, you would think that you have to check column by column, but then randomness we saw can very easily detect that. Now, in a celebrated result, Kalyana Sundaram and Schnitz showed that, in fact, the randomized complexity of said disjointness function is very large, is omega n. And this was uh, eventually simplified uh, a little bit by Rasborov. And uh, this has been a very important result uh, in the theory of computation because uh, this, uh, this result, uh, especially the one due to Rasborov, has found applications in other areas as well. Okay, so that was my uh, primer with the, uh, with the classical uh, uh, two party model. And as you might wonder, what is the connection to the graph problem? Because we, we sort of dived into this communication game. Now, uh, as I said, I will have to introduce a, slight new a slightly new model, which is very close to this classical model, which I will call the advice model. And that will capture uh, the, the graph problem that we are interested in. So, so, let me describe this model. Now, again, you have two players, Alice and Bob. Now, Alice gets not one input x, but she gets k instances of n bit strings, x1 through xk. And, uh, and Bob gets, again, uh, one instance y. And assume now you have some function f, which is defined for the classical Alice-Bob model. So, f, small f, is a function that depends on two n bits, x and y. And out of every such function, we are going to build another function, which I call capital F, uh, well, uh, capital F subscript f k cross 1, k is this k. Because the, the cross one here is because, because you, this is an asymmetric uh, model. You could also have had y1 through yk. So the k cross one uh, is meant to rem remind you that there is an asymmetry uh, inbuilt in this model. So out of every such function, we build this new function. And what does it do? It's a very natural function. You have now three sets of inputs, x1 through xk, y, and an index i which points to uh, one of these uh, indices x1 through xk, and you output just f of x i y. So, given any function f, I can uh, define a new function in this way. And uh, well, where is i? 
Well, I is on the forehead of a new player called Charlie. So, uh, so I is not seen by Charlie, but I is accessible to both Alice and Bob. And uh, the idea is that Charlie, who sees X and Y, gives an advice privately to Alice. Okay, this, ad ad this advice is a private advice that goes to Alice, and I'll tell you in a moment why it has to be private. So Charlie gives this advice, and uh, then he bolts from the game. Alice has this advice, and now the question is how much do Alice and Bob need to communicate, given Charlie's private advice to Alice, to solve the same problem. Okay. So now they communicate with each other, and this is a an, an standard communication uh, phase, okay. bipartite communication phase. How many bits do, do they need to communicate? So if f, the base function small f, was hard, the question is can Charlie meaningfully give a short advice that helps Alice and Bob? to solve the problem. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, you know, how many bits will depend on how much advice uh, Charlie uh, is allowed to give. For instance, if Charlie gives k bits of advice, then the game is easy because Charlie doesn't know i but can pre-compute all the possible answers in a k bit string and then Alice will not need any communication even. She can just give the answer. So what we want is m to be much smaller than k. Okay, so m is little o of k, and with such a short advice, can Charlie help? That's the question. Now, the key point, which will become clear, is uh, Charlie's advice crucially depends on both x and y. He has access to everything except i. And this model, uh, which, uh, which uh, from an advice point of view, seems to be a very uh, natural, and I hope you will. Uh, uh, agree that will become uh, is a fascinating model. Actually, was introduced in 2010 by Patrascu, uh, and he and he introduced this model exactly to solve the data structure problem. So, what what is the connection to the data structure? It's the, the data structure problem. It's actually very simple. So now all I'm going to say is assume that we want to solve the disjointness problem. Okay, so the base function is disjointness small f is disjointness, and I want to solve that problem in this new model. And if I do have a good uh, data structure algorithm for the first problem, the dynamic shortest path problem, then that will induce a protocol, an efficient protocol where Charlie would give very few bits of advice to solve the disjointness problem in this new model. Okay? And that is the connection. And why is this so? Is because, well, let's take this hard instance that I just talked about before the purported hard instance. So given x1 through xk, these are subsets. So you can, anybody who has access to x can generate this corresponding bipartite graph, right? Because x, each xi is a subset of 1 through n, and you connect the, the appropriate vi's uh, accordingly. And, uh, and so, so in th that's the first phase of the problem. In the second phase, you get a y which again one can generate if you have access to y in exactly the way, uh, in the same way. So y is a subset of 1 through n, you connect them. Now, if we do have a data structure algorithm, then remember that when given y in phase 2, there were at most order n tau updates to your original data structure, where tau was the proportionality constant, right? Tau was the amortized cost. And what Charlie is going to do is he has access both to x and y. So he knows what these update positions were for, for the data structure algorithm, right? And so Charlie encapsulates that in his message and sends it over to Alice. Okay. And uh, now the claim is when Charlie disappears, Alice will be able to solve this problem very fast given the third phase of the data structure algorithm. Remember, in the third phase of the data structure algorithm, you had an index i, and in order tau time, you were, you were calculating the shortest path. So what Charlie does, uh, sorry, what Alice does is that she knows this algorithm, of course, uh, the third phase of the algorithm. And the third phase of the algorithm is like a decision tree. It asks you to query certain portions of the data structure. Now, if the decision tree asks you to query an updated portion of the data structure, then Alice can consult this private advice that she has obtained uh, from, uh, from Charlie. And, and, and will be able to compute that. And if she finds out, well, she has to, she has to query certain unupdated portions of the data structure, 
then she is going to request Bob because Bob have, has access to all of X. Bob knows the original data structure, right? And so Charlie, uh, sorry, Alice uh, uh, toggles between the private advice M and uh, uh, communicates with Bob as as specified by the third phase of the. Uh, you're right, sorry. Uh, I, I am ignoring the logarithmic factor because uh, the logarithmic factor comes because I have to specify the portion of the data structure and I've assumed it to be polynomial, the size of the data structure. So that's, that's also important. So it's, it should be ordered star tau ignoring, but if tau is polylog, the whole thing is still polylog, right? So, <clears throat> so, uh, so that's, that's, that's the connection. That's a very nice connection, which now the question is, can therefore tau be polylog of n, right? Uh, so if you can, if, uh, the point is, if you, if you do have a data structure algorithm with polylogarithmic amortized cost, then with a very short advice, Charlie will be able to squish the complexity of disjointness, which is omega n in the two-party model, to polylog in the three-party model. Parity of the, the of, uh, absolutely. Also, no, so so that's a yeah. So actually, for any explicit function, uh, we we have no we have no lower bounds in this model. That's right. So so for most functions, you would get the reason uh, Patrascu thought about set disjointness is several natural problems reduced to set disjointness. Okay. So <clears throat> and the connection, uh, the formal connection to data structures is the following. So if in a protocol for this asymmetric version of set disjoinness, Charlie gives little o of k bits of advice, and Alice and Bob, uh, then, then Alice and Bob, the conjecture is then Alice and Bob in every such protocol would have to communicate enormously n to the omega one, polynomial number of bits. And if you prove that, then you of course derive uh, the, uh, from, the, from, the, from the previous slide, uh, it follows that you derive strong lower bounds on amortized complexity of data structure problems, right, including the dynamic shortest problem, and this would be a huge breakthrough. Now, if you think about it, you know, why stop at that? What's preventing us to say something much stronger, which in fact Patrascu does say in his paper, which is, so take now any function, he strengthens the conjecture in two ways. Now forget about set disjoint. let f be any function, small f, okay? And now if there is a protocol in, uh, for such a function in which, again, Charlie gives very few bits of advice, but an Alice and Bob co communicates, I don't know, some L of n bits, then there exists a two-party party protocol of cost order of ln for f. And what's the reason to expect this is because you think that for many instances, many xi's, information theoretically, Charlie is giving very few bits. There are k, k instances, all independent, right? And so somehow you would think that Charlie for those instances, there are some hard instances where Charlie is completely redundant, and you can get rid of Charlie. It should be wrong to say that this independent instances because the y is so many more than the That's right, that's right. So that's, uh, that's. Uh, so something that we're doing, you'll exploit that really. Yeah, you're, 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 you're seeing uh, ahead, yeah. That's, that's exactly the point. But, but, uh, but it's, all, it's still a very tempting conjecture to think that how can you exploit this, right? Because you're. You're, you're giving this private advice to, to the person who's missing the most of the inputs x, okay? And uh, so, so, then there, so, so that's a strong conjecture, and the reason to do this, if this is true, what you'd expect is sort of the proof technique would be very different, because then this proof technique should be guided by some information theoretic idea which would eliminate Charlie, and then home in on, 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 not, on, on Charlie not being there, right? So the reason for, uh, having this conjecture is with a certain proof technique in mind. Okay, and it's a very reasonable conjecture still. And uh, as I said, the intuition is Charlie's advice gives very little info about many exiles. And uh, so Patrascu's conjecture, uh, the strong form, in his conjecture, he didn't specify whether he was making this conjecture for deterministic protocols or for randomized protocols. In fact, uh, this conjecture is interesting for both protocol, uh, for, for, for both models, turns out that for deterministic, it's quite simple to come up with a counterexample or to this conjecture. And it's our old friend, equality. So again, assume that small f is equality. 
it is of course deterministically very hard for Alice and Bob. No, 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 no. So, 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 oh, sorry. So, 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 he's str it's stronger in two ways. First of all, it's universal. And second of all, in disjointness, the thing that you need is not exactly this tight relationship. So, it's strong in two ways. It's, it's, it's strengthened in two, two, two aspects. Yeah. Right. So, that's what exactly I'm saying. So, 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 in the conjecture, he didn't mention whether it's ra randomized or deterministic. Okay. So if you prove for deterministic protocols, lower bound, you get lower bound for deterministic data structure algorithms, and uh, you know, likewise for randomized. So it's interesting in both directions. But the point is, in this generality, the conjecture cannot be true. And it's going to come to your point. I mean, uh, the, you can exploit the fact that there is exactly one y in a simple way. So assume equality is hard for Alice and Bob, and you, you, you build this, concoct this function out of equality. And <clears throat> you'd exp equality was hard for two players. Now, here is Charlie. All he has to do is he observes, is there any xi that's equal to y? If there is none, he can just tell Alice, well, your answer is always going to be 0, because there is none equal. If, however, there is a j which is equal, all he has to do is send this information about j. Now, sending information about j takes log of k bits. A k is polynomial in n, so it's order log n. And uh, well, then Charlie disappears, and Alice takes this very short advice, log k, far, far fewer than Charlie is allowed to give, right? And sends it over to Bob. And Bob, having this advice, nicely infers whether x j is equal, x i is equal to x j. So Charlie has been, in some sense, able to teach Bob about y with very few bits. So the conditional information about y, conditioned on knowing x. And the function having a certain value is, is very large, even though, even though the advice bits are much smaller. Right? So, so, so he, he can just send back the answer. Right? And it sounds very simple, this protocol. And it sounds almost like, oh, this, may, this, is, this is probably naive, and, and, and it's not telling us much. But actually, it does tell us something, which is uh, the point that you know, this intuition that we have is, Charlie should aim to teach Alice about x is not the right intuition. Charlie can teach y to, uh, to the player who's missing y. And that's, that seems to be a very natural thing to do, because y is few bits. So it's Alice and Bob trust Charlie. Yeah. Yeah, it's a completely trusted thing. Okay. Sorry, uh, there's no cryptographic uh, connection. I mean, I'm just talking about all players being trusted. They, they love Charlie. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so, the, so what's going on? Just let's recap what's going happening. So, the intuition behind the conjecture is uh, uh, that you know, was Charlie cannot give much information about x to Alice, and as I said, the counterexample is showing that Charlie can teach Bob about y with very few bits. Okay. Now, the question is, can Charlie do this for a really hard function? Equality is a, is, a, is not a very robust function, right? Can can he do the same trick for a function that's really hard, let's say for when f is hard for randomized protocols. Okay? And now we come back to set this join us. Uh, so uh, turns out that in fact Charlie can do somewhat. Okay? So there exists a deterministic protocol for this uh, asymmetric version of this join us, where Charlie, as you will see, gives far few bits of advice, fewer bits of advice than again he's allowed to, uh, certainly little o of k, and then Alice and Bob can communicate with each other and solve the problem in square root of n bits, it's again missing uh, log factors. So Charlie can certainly squish the complexity of, uh, uh, of a function like this join us from n to square root of n. Uh, OK, so for the next few slides, I'll try to give you, uh, in fact, I'll give you the full proof, because it's a very simple protocol. And, uh, and, and the intuition about equality, which seems like very trivial, actually works very nicely here. Okay? And, and so here is, here, here is the idea. So why is, uh, so this is our universe 1 through n. Right? And the, the Charlie's aim is somehow to exploit these xi's and teach y to the player who's missing y. Okay? So how does he go about it? So assume you have a set xi, which is very large, fairly large. Okay? 
And the point is x, y intersection of, with y is very sparse. So x, i, and y intersect only at few spots. Okay? And Charlie loves such rows simply because now he can exploit that. He just needs to tell this i, okay, which takes log of k bits. And he also specifies x, i intersection of y. Suppose x, i intersected with y at just exactly one spot. Okay, so specifying the intersection set takes about log n bits. So with log k plus a few bits required to specify this, which is order log n, let's assume. And again, log k is log n because k is polynomial. With just logarithmic number of bits, what is he doing? He is informing the player who's missing y about a, about a large chunk, right? I mean, now given this information, the player's, player knows exactly what y looks like in this, in this spot. Oh, yeah, 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 sorry, you're, 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 you're right, yeah, 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 sorry about that, yeah, yeah. it's a J, yeah, 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 yes, why is small, sparse, and XJ is large, right, I mean, meaning the, the, the number of elements in XJ is large, so this thing is large, then by just telling few, few uh, bits, Charlie has informed the Y player about how Y look, the Y intersected with this subset. We just we just love, okay, and and this is going to be very helpful as we will see. Bob will start inferring large amounts of bits, only getting few bits of information, okay, and so so the picture is like initially everything was unknown to Bob about why. Now the un, the uncertainty about why has shrunk from this whole thing to just this thing. Right? That's how you, you should look at it, okay, and. Sorry? If this is not the case, then hopefully we'll see. When, when this will be used for many of the other uh, Yeah, we, we, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so 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 uh, just uh, uh, one formal slide, which is this easy instances of set disjointness. So these are these are easy, meaning Charlie is going to ignore these rules. He's not going to do anything about them. Leave them untested. Which is suppose Charlie looks at so again, these are all J. So uh, uh, he, he looks at a row, he doesn't even bother about them because, so sigma is some parameter which is meaning that you know, this is a really sparse guy. And you, know, you, you don't need to help the players because all we are aiming for is square root of n. And because for such rows, Bob, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Bob can send Alice the whole, the whole row. It takes only a few bits, right? So, so he's completely ignoring such small uh, rows. And then he's also going to ignore, for a reason that will become clear, what I call these rows which have dense intersection, meaning uh, the intersection of xi and y is a large fraction of uh, xi itself. Okay? He's going to also ignore these rows, and you will see why. Uh, so Charlie is going to only focus on rows which do not have this property. Okay? <clears throat> All right, so, so how does the algorithm work? And he's going to do this recursively, as we will see. So uh, uh, at the beginning, the player who's missing y knows nothing about uh, y in this whole set, right? So the set, of uh, the set of ignorance, S, is 1 through n for that player. And this set is going to evolve uh, as Charlie starts disclosing things. So he's doing this all in one message. But we're going to view this as if he's doing it iteratively. Okay. So let's say we have a row x1, so, uh, and, and x1 has size t1, which assume is large. And our largeness parameter, remember, was sigma. So this is somewhat large, and it has very sparse. So it's a so hard case, meaning it, x1 hardly intersects with y. Maybe it doesn't intersect at all. Okay. So you should include that as well. So, as I said, all the Charlie is going to exploit this. He's going to uh, bring down the, 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 the set of ignorance by this factor n minus t1. Right? He's going to specify this row, specify the, the elements which are both in x1 x one and y, and the, and, the, and the set of ignorance goes down by at least t1, by exactly t1. Okay? Now what happens is, now he focuses not on the whole universe. Because he's in this case, Charlie. This is like 
Uh -huh. Exactly. Because I'm assuming there are only few green pieces. OK? Yeah, yeah. So, it's, so, the, so the, unknown, the unknown thing shrinks. No? Now, now what Charlie does is, so this is dynamically evolving. So now Charlie takes x2, maybe x2 is hard, I mean some xj, and then he's looking at all rows intersected with s. Because in s complement, his job is done. He's already taught y. Right, so now he starts looking at x2 intersected with s. So now do you also update the definition of one, one yes, with respect to s. Everything now becomes with respect to x. Yes, yes. And so, so exactly. So now you look at x2 intersected with s, and there's another thing which I should mention is well, this, the, the easiness condition, uh, you, if for example Charlie fi finds that x2 intersected with s intersected with y, is not entirely contained in S, then again he ignores it. Because if it is not entirely contained in S, there is some element which is common to X2 and Y, which is outside of S, S in S complement, which already the player missing Y knows. He doesn't need to wor worry about that. Right? So he only works on this if, it, if, if the intersection set is entirely contained in S. OK? Uh, good. So, uh, so again, he plays this game, and this keeps on shrinking, right? And he goes for r rounds. At the end of the rth round, let's say the final set S is such that every row, if you look at any row, you, 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 you look at its intersection, sorry, every row, every row projected down to S is easy. Okay? So, unless that happens, Charlie doesn't stop. So, so the stopping condition is when every row projected, every row projected with the final set has become easy. Okay. So what's going on? So the first observation is that, as I said, now if you take any row, these all should be j. Uh, one of two things must be happening. Otherwise, Charlie wouldn't have stopped. Is that x i intersected with y is either not entirely contained in S, right, which 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 then Charlie uh, ignores, or x i intersected with s is easy. Now, the, easy def the definition of easy is as before. Okay. Otherwise, Charlie would keep going. right? And the fact is, Bob learns y intersected with s complement. Okay. So these are the two observations that you need. Now, how many bits is Charlie sending? Well, uh, he's sending for each round, he's sending log of k bits to specify the row that he's exploiting. So r times log of k plus in each of these, these were hard instances, so the intersections were sparse. Right? He's giving out few bits. So when, when, the, when the intersection size was t1, right? I mean, he, uh, sorry, when not, not the intersection side, but, but, the, but the size of x1 uh, projected on s was t1, he would at most have to tell t1 over sigma element. Because by definition, this is easy, and it, that takes another log n to specify the, the, the elements. So that's the amount of information that Charlie is sending. And well, R cannot be very large because in each round you are cutting off sigma uh, ch chunks of un uh, uncertainty, and there is only n uh, is the size of a universe, so R is at most n over sigma. And of course, these things are disjoint t1, t2, and so on. So the summation of that is the whole universe at most. Exact, uh, so, so, so that's, ex that's at most n obvious things. So Charlie's just plugging this in. You, what do you get? Charlie's information content, uh, sorry, number of bits is at most n over sigma times log of k plus log of n. Right? And uh, so now Charlie's job is done. Now what do these players do? So if xi intersection with s is easy, Alice and Bob, they can communicate between themselves. So, so uh, Bob who knows x, if he finds that this is easy, he is going to just communicate the Sigma uh, sigma elements that that he has to send, which takes about sigma log n bits, right? Either that happens, or he finds that uh, that x i the the intersection of x i and y is not entirely contained in S, in which case he also can declare the answer because he knows y in S complement. Yes, 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 and I'm coming to the final case. And now, easiness could be in one way, which is that this, the, the, the set here is sparse. But if the set here is large, then he knows the answer is one. 
because otherwise Charlie would have, Charlie would have used it, right? Because if the answer is zero, then the, then the, then the intersection set is super sparse and Charlie would have gone on. So, the, so, so, so he doesn't need to do anything, right? So now if you set sigma is equal to square root of n, uh, the, 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 the cost of the protocol, uh, it turns out that by just setting sigma to square root of n, you optimize these numbers and you get a square root of n log n protocol. Okay? And the whole protocol is deterministic. There is, no, there, there, there is nothing randomized. So, <clears throat> so that's it. So that's, that's the protocol. You get a square root of n log n protocol. Uh, now the conclusion is therefore, for the set disjointness function, Charlie can reduce the cost quadratically. And, and uh, the question is, can, so of course, Patrascu's conjecture, even for the, this just shows that Patrascu's strong form of the conjecture is not true, even when you think of uh, hard functions which are hard in a, ran, in, in, in a randomized sense. Now, can Charlie's advice? About this uh, conclusion, do you know any cascading for inner protocol? No. No. <clears throat> We know more. I will be, sorry. It's a good question. It's a good question. No, uh, because uh, there is a slack in this going from, and, and, and that that kills you. You can't use this protocol to 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 uh, have any good data structure. Is that your was that your question? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. I'm not sure, but I don't think so. Yes, so yeah. I'm sure there is none for, uh, w w doing a reverse engineering because if there was, Patrascu would have known it and he wouldn't have made that conjecture because every such but thing would give, a, would give a protocol for set disjointness, yeah. right? I mean, any such non trivial yeah. algorithm. Okay. So right. A from the sure, sure. Okay. So, how much more time do I have? You have uh, 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. Okay. So, I will venture into something. 13. 13 more. Okay. Okay. So, so, so I started a bit late. Okay. So, uh, uh, so the question is can Charlie's advice save more than polynomial number of bits, right? You, you, you still have, so you could still think that something as general as what Patrascu aimed for works, except that you can't tighten it with order L of n, but you know, it still it cannot give you uh, more than polynomial saving. If that were true, you would still be okay to prove lower bounds, right? Turns out even this is false. And uh, since, uh, since uh, uh, you know, we've been talking about learning, uh, it's sort of natural to start thinking, well, can, can former computational learning theory help us? And it turns out it can, okay? So uh, uh, the next theorem is that, you know, in fact, there exists function f that has randomized two-party complexity omega n, just like said disjointness or inner product, but whose asymmetric version has an efficient deterministic three-party protocol with these costs. So these are super efficient protocols meaning Charlie just gives order log square n bits of advice to Alice, and then the Alice Bob face just has order log square n uh, communication. So the total communicated bits is order log square of n, which completely uh, uh, kills the hope of, uh, of, of saying something as general, uh, or even near as general as what Patrascu was hoping for. Okay? And I will try to uh, give you, uh, I will be a bit uh, fast. Uh, actually, it's very simple, the idea, uh, once you know how to look at the problem. So, so we will use ideas from learning theory to show this. And uh, there is just going to be a one set uh, primer about learning theory. So just bear with me. So I will be fast here. So you, know, you have a teacher and a learner in a learning setting. And uh, there is some function f, uh, there is some set of functions which is a co which is a, uh, con uh, a concept class and the teacher has some function f from the concept class in mind and uh, the aim of the teacher is to teach the learner about this function 
And the way it uh, occur, uh, happens is by teach, uh, is teaching by example. So you know, th there is some distribution mu uh, also, which is in uh, which is uh, which is implicit. So the distribution mu is over the over the domain of these functions. Okay, and what you want is uh, so, uh, and this distribution is completely unknown to the learner. So you want an algorithm which is going to be working for all possible distributions, and, uh, and, and the learner asks for an example, keeps on asking, and the teacher, all she does is she just samples a point from the domain according to this distribution mu, and gives that point as well as the valuation of the function on that point. And then the learner probably hasn't still yet learned, so he asks for more examples, and the teacher keeps doing, repeats the process. And after m examples, uh, you know, the learner pro declares, "Well, I, I have learned it. You know, I, I think it's h." And what you want is that now the teacher is going to give a test, uh, is going to test the learner in the following way: she's going to pick a point again according to mu, and the learner has to be able to, of course, answer the value of that function, h of x q. And uh, you want h, well, you, 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 the teacher is pretty liberal, so the teacher says, well, h may not always be giving the right answer, so h has to approximate f well in the following sense, that if you choose a point according to this distribution at random, then the probability you know, h and f are, uh, give different answers is very small. It's, it's, so that's liberal definition. And Again, the learner could be randomized, so you want the, this approximation to happen with high probability. So this probability is over the internal randomness of the learner. Okay? The, uh, the learner knows the concept class. Yes, the learner knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 as you will see, I mean, I am being here very liberal. I'm not even assuming that the learner is polynomial time, which is the typical case. But I'm not assuming that the learner is a polynomial time machine. Right? He has this appearance of a bob, so he has unbounded computational power. <laughs> no, I'm not charging anything. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so the question is how many examples M are needed to learn a class C? And there are many concepts like you know, uh, decision list, conjunctions. Uh, for which you have very efficient uh, learning uh, procedures. Okay. Now, uh, now, how is this relevant for our situation? Is now we are given a function in communication complexity, f, right, which is a bipartite function of this form. And uh, um, uh, where does this t come from? Okay, okay. So, so this is a two to the n by two to the n matrix, right? And uh, if you look at any one. So that, that's just the, the, the matrix defined by the Boolean function. It's a Boolean matrix. Now pick a row, uh, sorry, pick a column, right? That defines a function on, on 0, 1 to the n, right? Okay. And so, so such a bipartite function obviously induces a, a concept class, right? this matrix. And this point of view is, is very helpful. So, so uh, the definition of given a function f is induces this concept class by just looking at all possible columns of this matrix. Right? Okay. And <clears throat> here's the connection between communication and learning. Uh, so Sherstov in 2010, based on uh, many previous works, was able to show this following uh, beautiful theorem, which says that there are functions f with linear randomized two-party complexity. So you know, as hard as said, disjointness or inner product. Okay. But the concept class can be learned, learned from just a constant number of examples. Okay, actually, his theorem is much more informative. I'm hiding those details. This is what we need. This is the abstraction that we need for our case. Okay, so so there are functions that can be learned, but still uh, in linear randomized two-party complexity uh, requires linear two-party uh, random linear complexity. And uh, when I say learned, it is it is possible to learn them under all possible distributions. It is constant VC dimension. There, yeah, well, I, I mean, I still mean this, uh, but yeah. it turns out it turns out it has constant VC dimension as well. I just didn't want to get into VC dimension. Okay. So, uh, so what we show is, on the other hand, that if CF can be learned, I don't know, let's say from M examples, 
okay, the concept class, then the, uh, so it's the same F here, right? So then the corresponding uh, uh, three player version of the problem induced from F has actually a randomized protocol of cost order M times log K. Okay? And, uh, and, and if you just plug in these two theorems, you see why uh, what I was saying is true that, uh, that you will have, I mean, choose a F from here, which has linear randomized complexity, and this is constant number of examples, so M is constant, so in order log K, randomized protocol, you can do it. Okay? And I will just quickly try to uh, uh, tell you because, the, because it's very simple. Okay? Uh, What do you mean? This is what? Sorry, no, it's a randomized protocol. Uh, are you saying where is the randomness? No, he's asking whether Charlie is randomized. Charlie is randomized. Actually, Charlie is the only player who will be randomized. Okay. So the, the number of bits is the total number of bits of the bytes together with the Yes. Uh, everything. Uh, okay. So, uh, so we are assuming that the base function f can be learned with m examples, right? And now we want to construct such a protocol. That's the hypothesis. Now, uh, okay, here's Charlie. Now, you, I'm going to do, use Yao's principle. So what, I, what my aim is going to be is you give me a distribution mu, and for every possible distribution mu, this mu is a distribution on this, this, and that. So it's a distribution, on, let's call this x. x cross y cross uh, 1 through k, the set 1 through k, right? So for every possible distribution mu, I'm going to come up with a deterministic protocol with the, with the required uh, cost, which is sort of interesting because, uh, and, and then you conclude by using the harder side of Yao's theorem, the duality side, that there is a, therefore a randomized protocol. So in communication complexity, I, I, I haven't seen this being used in the other way. It typically used for lower bounds. I don't know, maybe. It's, 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 it's possible. Uh, so, okay, so, so, so you have a distribution mu, and uh, now Charlie sees x and y, right? So given he knows the distribution mu, and he sees x and y, so mu induces a distribution on what is on his forehead, of course, and he knows this distribution, because he knows x, y, right? Okay, now what is he going to do? As I said, this is a learning theoretic result, so uh, the, the, the point of view is he, the, the player Bob needs to learn f y under this distribution mu x cross y. Right? If he can do that, then it's fine. And Charlie is going to be the teacher. So it's now, having said that, it's obvious, right? What Charlie needs to do is that he's going to sa sample this indices from 1 through k exactly according to this distribution that he knows, mu x y, independently at random. Okay? And then he gives this pairs, as in, the, uh, as in the learning scenario, he's going to give, so he needs to sample m of these, and he also gives the corresponding valuations of this function, but the unknown function. The hmm? he does not send the no, he just sends this indices, that's right, yeah. Yeah, because Bob will have access to x, that's right. So uh, he encodes this in this message, and he sends it over, okay? And this, what's the length of this message? This length of this message is m log k. Uh, that, that two is fishy. So it's order m log k. So uh, because there are m uh, examples, and uh, you know each each takes log k plus one bit, so it's m times order m log k. Okay. Uh, you don't have. You don't need the two there. Right. Okay. Yeah. So so it's order m log k, and then uh, as always, you know. You know, in all of our protocol, Alice is just behaving like a conduit, right? She gets something from Charlie, and then she just transfers it dumbly to Bob, okay? And that's what she does here, okay? She sends it over to Bob, and now Bob is now going to play the role of this learner in this learning setup. The setup was geared towards that. So he has everything in place, and now he guesses this, approximates this function fy with h, which we assumed he could do. Because, uh, because f is learnable with m examples under every distribution, right? And, and, and Bob doesn't need to know the distribution, right? And so Bob just sends h of xj, and we know now with high probability this h of xj is the right answer. That's what it means to be learnable, right? So the probability under this random coin toss is, so this is just a little bit of 
thing. So this is this is this is what I just said in math, right? And uh, the point is now, since this happens for every x and y, right? And just if you apply a counting argument, you can fix the random bits. So what you were saying can be done, obviously, by fixing the random bits. Or oh, you were saying something else, right? Sorry. Oh, so Yes. So I think if we if we go literally exactly as we have, yes. you know, it's gonna it's much easier to be pretty good with respect to delta if we're doing it like log one over delta. Log one over delta and then right. scale that back and then right. um, or maybe like the you know, like like But maybe we should take this uh, yeah. uh, uh, off yeah. 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 So the point is here you can fix the random bits uh, uh, to something so that you get a deterministic protocol. And now we just invoke yeah, right? And you get a randomized protocol. Okay. The length of i is logarithmic. No, it, it, this this is this can be de-randomized as you will see, but uh, in a, in a more general way. But directly, pro you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so now if you invoke uh, Yao's uh, principle, now you get a randomized protocol. Okay, and so th that's it. Now now you might be wondering, okay, uh, I haven't showed you a deterministic version, which possibly can be done for this particular thing. In a if you just want to de-randomize. De this particular example, you can do it carefully, but here's my punchline, and which is actually also a very simple observation. Uh, give, if, you, if I give you this, this fact is true, then you can do it, which is that, uh, you know, in fact, this model is very strange. This three-party model, there is no extra power with randomness, okay? So uh, take any function and of this form, if you have an efficient randomized protocol, then you also have an efficient deterministic protocol. Okay, and so you know uh, the thing before can be de-randomized. Any yes. Yeah, yeah. But Charlie can also de-randomize himself by by giving sending a few more but things. Yeah. No, so that's where uh, Newman's theorem comes in. So, so you, you need to use Newman's theorem that the random bits. So uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so if you just apply Newman's theorem, you know that order logarithmic number of random bits is enough. Are you allowed to repeat states? No. But who's saying some extra? Yeah, you would pay some extra, but it's a log factor. I mean, I, I'm not saying this is exactly the same, but it's just a little bit uh, more. Okay, so which is a bit uh, sort of surprising thing. I mean, uh, that, that this model is very subtle. I mean, you can do lots of things using Charlie. Okay. So, so Charlie can, de every, pro every, de every protocol can be efficiently de-randomized. Okay. And uh, I will now end the, the, the two more slides, which is that, you know, there's something weird happening in our, in our protocol there are two very, uh, very re apparently restrictive features, right? Which is that Charlie is sending very short advice. I mean, Charlie is allowed to send much more advice than what he's sending here. In the equality and uh, this learning theory theoretic result, he's sending only log of n bits of advice about, right? Uh, polylog bits of advice. In the set disjoinness protocol, he's sending square root of n. Why, 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 why? I mean, this appear very naturally. And one interesting direction is to see if you can get in more interesting protocols by somehow allowing Charlie to send more advice because he's allowed to send more. He's allowed to send little o of k. Where is that one? one bit of Meaning, for example, can you reduce the uh, complexity of set disjointness from square root of? I mean, can you disprove the conjecture even for set disjointness? Okay. Uh, uh, so, so, so Charlie's advice is very short, much shorter than he is. He, He's allowed to. And uh, the other thing is, how are we using Alice? We are using Alice in a very limited way, in the sense that you know, Alice conveys 
just a portion of Charlie's message. In, in our case, since Charlie's advice was so short, she could afford to send the whole thing, right? But Alice is conveying a portion of Charlie's message to Bob without using any knowledge of her knowledge of index i, which, I mean, it seems, uh, if you think about it, 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 it's not clear how can Alice exploit her knowledge of i. But uh, you know, the, when you try to prove lower bounds, this is what kills you, that possibly Alice can use i, and then nothing seems to work. Okay? And then Bob, of course, is a two-round protocol, okay, in which the first round we are calling 0.5, because you know, Alice is not using all of her information. And then Bob uh, then communicates with, uh, with his full information, and then Alice declares the answer. Right? And, uh, and why I'm saying this is because you know, we, I mean, there's a, again, there's a theorem uh, which, which we show is that you know, too short advice is not going to get you far. I mean, we can show that if you do stay with too short advice, for set disjoinness, if you send order square root of n bits, then Bob must communicate omega square root of n. So our algorithm is tight in that sense. And this follows very easily from uh, strong direct product theorems that exist. I won't go into them. And then the other feature is also very restrictive because, uh, anyway, we are running out of time. What I want to say is that if you have this, forget these numbers, the the, the message is if you have this restrictive uh, Bob uh, Alice interaction, 1.5 round, then no matter how many bits Charlie sends, again, you can't do better. So our, our protocols are tight from two different points of view. Okay, if, you, if Charlie sends too few bits, you can't improve. If Charlie sends as many bits as he's allowed to, little o of k, but then Alice and Bob do not interact in a more meaningful way, then you can't improve. And uh, so these, these, uh, th th this theorem uh, uses an interesting information theoretic argument. So anyway, that's all I want to say. Sorry for taking so long. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, well, because you see, square root of n, that Charlie's advice corresponds to the second phase update, right? And that is n tau. So if I if I say n tau is at most square root of n, it doesn't buy me anything about tau, right? So not in the way. I don't know. I, uh, okay. Well, it seems to me, yeah, maybe. It seems very restrictive. But the thing is, the interesting thing is, I think uh, it's time to attack the problem directly. It seems like this communication model is very subtle. It's missing something because the upper bound, for all you know, are not translating into data structure. And it seems that they cannot, right? So, therefore, maybe the communication model is too powerful. And maybe maybe one needs to come up with a with a new model or with a. With yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I haven't uh, tried it very hard, but what's interesting is, I think uh, right off my head, I don't even have an example of a random function which is hard. For this full model, okay. So 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 show me an argument. Usually these are very simple, right? In any model, so show me a, show me that most functions are hard. Have you tried it or I, 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 was, I mean, just when I was preparing this talk, I I, I mean, I haven't tried it, uh, but that's a good thing. I, I realize that this is a good thing to. If if this cannot be done, then this is very strange, right? I mean, so just, a <laughs> just a random function, but now no restrictions, of course, on of course on on these things. I mean, I mean. Yeah. I mean the full the full model. What is the rate of k in k? K 
k is for so for right so so for 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 real data structure applications what you need is k is n to the 1 plus gamma for some constant gamma less than 1 So again, for uh, for those applications, it's n times polylog. For data structure applications, n times polylog. So it's, it's just a file story. Yeah. It's not going to appear that the bounds of this is greater than the bounds of this. No, no. Our current bounds, of course, doesn't give any any any. You mean the lower bounds? They are only for restrictive protocols. No, no. But if uh, if your dream bound was greater than yeah. Because if the dream bounds would be whenever n is little o of k, you get n to the omega 1 lower bound on the Alice Bob uh, part, right? Which could still be true. We, we, which could still be true. Which could be true, still be true. Yeah. Uh, k is larger than n. K is larger than n, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. K, k is n to the 1 plus gamma, yeah. Yeah, yeah much larger than n. So, I mean, from a communication complexity point of view, uh, k could be, I mean, take k to be as large as you, as it would help, take any polynomial you know, n, and that would still be a great result if you, one can show this, right? So, the, the typical, let's say, the random function with a weak, I assume. It should be there. Yeah, I'm not saying that this is, how I, I just, uh, just thought about it for. Yes. Let's say. Yes, much less. Yeah. Well, you would then expect at least to show that it would be into the omega one. We might even show that it would be omega n. I mean, for random functions, it should be. For two players, it's very easy to show, right? So random functions there are random functions of this form, right? You are picking a random small f. Of course, you're not picking a random function, which is easy, right? You're picking a you're picking a random function small f, which is defined on this two n bits, right? And then I don't see how to use discrepancy because it's a, I mean discrepancy is too powerful, right? Because if you do use discrepancy, but uh, but uh, rectangle. So because you know Charlie's advice. It's not clear how you. Yeah. No, no, I, no, no. Don't quote, don't quote me on that. I'm, 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 I, I haven't tried the random thing. It's just, it's just, I, it, it was just when I was pre preparing this, this was thinking that we never thought about this, and it's probably good to think about it. Oh, the the the, the, the learning, yeah. yeah, yeah. So these are some uh, Zarankovich matrices that are used to build these functions. So these the, these are not. I mean, these are these come from a probabilistic counting argument. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So the VC dimension of these matrices, oh, the Zarankovich matrices themselves, you're saying. Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Oh, that's not a function. So I am forgetting the details. So he, he, he constructs a function uh, some way. Yeah, I, I can't recall offhand. Yeah. 